When I first found out that I was pregnant with Stephanie, I believe I was approximately five months pregnant. And um, when she, um, two weeks before she was born, um, her dad and I split up. And um, the night before she was born, um, I started bleeding. And so I went into the hospital and she was delivered like, I believe it was around three hours later. And she was premature. And as soon as she was um, born, obviously they knew something was wrong um, because they wanted to whisper out of the room very quickly. And I um, asked them if I could see her first. And so they, they brought her back and let me see her for just a minute. And then they took her. I'm not sure how many hours later it was before they took her down to Loma Linda. There was an ambulance that took her. Um, I remember crying that evening and talking to the nurse. Um, and I didn't understand what was happening. I was like 24 years old. had a baby bed and different things, but I ended up going and buying a car seat and some sleepers and different things, you know, because I wasn't sure if it was a boy or a girl before she was born. This was the first dress that we ever bought for her. And she wore this one when she was in the hospital. A very comfortable little onesie. And so I bought some little girl things and headed um, down to the hospital. And so when I got down there, I, I never ever dreamed that um, I would be told that there was nothing that they could do to help her and that she was going to die. I remember being really upset and I said, you mean you can put a man on the moon, but there's nothing you can do to help her. And he said no. And so they sent the coroner's number with me, and this is the card that they wrote down the coroner's number for me. So I took the card and her and went back to Barstow. I said, I really don't know if I can bring her home and let her die in the house. Am I going to be able to live there after she dies? You know, I was just so um, filled full of mixed emotions. I didn't know if I was coming or going. And um, so when I got to Barstow, I was like, I want to go to, I'll, I'll go stay in a motel until I can decide what I'm going to do. And I think it was Wednesday that I brought her back home because I, you know, come to the conclusion that it, it, she had the right to die in her own home, you know, if she was going to die anywhere. And during the two days in the motel, it gave me time to really bond with her. And I had called my mom and I said, Mom, you really need to come out and see your granddaughter. I said, she's so beautiful. You have to see her before she dies. I got a call from Dr. Deming on Friday afternoon, and he told me that um, there was a Dr. Bailey who had been out of town, and he had done some research doing um, transplantation. About 10 years ago, when I was in training at the Hospital of Sick Children in, uh, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I became uh, deeply impressed with the fact that we'd seen a number of babies with incurable heart disease, incorrectable heart disease, babies in whom you could only experiment uh, surgically with. And uh, it impressed me that what those babies needed really was heart replacement. We were a little... Uh uh, stymied about how we were going to find donors for b human babies. No one was uh, volunteering dead babies' hearts for transplantation. 
And so we began to actually study the possibility of cross-species transplantation using, using baby baboons. We had uh, a number, a litany really, of babies that, that came and were diagnosed and died. And for whatever reasons, uh, along came this baby, Stephanie Fay. Uh, Doug Deming, one of the uh, bright young neonatologists, got on the horn and he talked to baby Faye's mother and said, you know, we have this, uh, this uh, protocol down here for a heart replacement for a baby like yours. It may be that your baby doesn't have to die, at least not without some effort at uh, saving her. If you would be interested, come on back down and, and I'll have you talk to Bailey, who has you know, been spearheading this effort. So I had to go find her dad to see if he wanted to go with me. And um, he couldn't come with me. So he said, well, why don't you just bring a tape recorder and you can tape it and then I'll listen to it. We've done our research. Well, the issue we try to look at from every angle. We're sort of in this stage now where we kind of need to devastate the industry. Uh, in addition to what's listed here, we've also developed some of the experience more recently in climates that is really transplants and different deadly types of criminal. I wondered if the doctor was a mad scientist. <laughs> I'm sure I had the same reaction as anybody else who first heard it. But when you get right down to it, it's just an organ. And it's a life-saving organ. And so we went over everything and tried to be pretty objective about it. Uh, that it was highly experimental and we weren't sure where it, were, where it was headed. Um, but. Without it, their baby was going to die. At that time, uh, I gave Dr. Bailey the okay to begin tests to see if she was going to be compatible with any of the baboons. And uh, Sandy Canarella, Nelson Canarella, who, who had been our external, if you will, consultant in immunology, or one of them, from New York uh, needed to be involved if we were going to do it. And in fact, before we chose to go ahead with it, I phoned her and I said, Sandy, are we ready? And he says, he says, Sandy, um, how are we doing on the experiments? And I said, well, I just finished the last one. It looks really great. As soon as I finish with my crew here, I'm going to give you a call. So just hang on because I know there's three hours difference. You know, he's got time. He would not let me hang up. And finally he said, okay, so then you would be able to tell our administration and the IRB that it's okay to go ahead. And I said, absolutely, I have no question about it. And he said, good, because I have a baby and six baboons. <laughs> I almost dropped the phone. <laughs> I was at home minding my own business on a Friday evening and the phone rang. First response, it was the unit. They were telling me that Dr. Bailey wanted room six ready. Well, I was trying to put two and two together, what they were trying to tell me. And then she said, Dr. Bailey's going to do his transplant. We don't know if it's tonight or what's going on. My first reaction after that was I was scared, like, well, I knew we were going to do it. We've been getting ready for over a year, but are we really ready? Will it work? And calling the staff together and telling them that we were going to do an infant transplant. They'd been preparing for it. They were ready for it. And then telling them that um, there was going to be a little difference with the surgery because of where the donor heart was being procured. And so I threw out, I said, um, and they were all like, okay. And I said, we're going to use a primate donor. And one of the nurses looks at me and says, what's a primate? <laughs> I said, okay. I said, we're going to use a baboon donor. And I can remember, I mean, the staff just looking at me. They had worked with babies with severe heart defects. They had worked with babies that had gone through attempted surgical repairs for the left hypoplastic. They all had worked with Dr. Bailey. Again, all the intentions and the rationale behind this surgery were not even a question for them. We were going to help a baby. So for the next week, it was, um, I was still staying in Barstow and 
my mom would stay with Bo during the day and I would drive up in the morning and come back in the evening and I was doing that every day. The hospital asked me if I wanted to stay in an apartment where it would be closer to the hospital where I wouldn't have so much driving to do. And I said yes and so um, Bo and my mom and I started staying in an apartment down here. Um, Teresa was just so brave. I, I, I can't imagine what it had to be like to be that mother, um, to make those enormous decisions. Um, she was a rock. You know, when I think about what she went through, I, just what I went through was terrific, and it wasn't my child. And I think she did the only thing she really could do, being a mother. And that was to say, yes, I want to do anything I can to save my child. She, I know that um, she almost died like the night before her surgery because I believed that her lungs were filling up with fluid. And um, I was had made friends with, um, I had met Bill Hinton, and he was a chaplain at the hospital which he became like a father figure to me. The day before, I was told the surgery's going to be tomorrow. And I had met Teresa and uh, the father, and we had a chance to get acquainted. And um, the day before the surgery, we made a, an agreement that the morning of the surgery, uh, they were going to take her about 7 o'clock, that we would be there at 6 o'clock. She instead, I, when I got there at six, I asked where she was. Oh, she's been in with the baby for an hour and a half. At six, well, at six o'clock, the three of us met, Len Bailey, Walter Concepcion, and myself. We were the three musketeers and um, made our final plans. And Waldo and I decided to go out for a walk. It was just exciting. It was just exciting but sober because this is all going to work very well or is it going to have very adverse outcome? And so this is the uncertainty. There's no precedent. You, you just don't have there any back history. So it's, it's exciting, but it's a lot of also sober responsibility that you got to be sure that everything is OK. We were walking away from the hospital, and we were watching the time because we knew we had to be back at 6.30 to start. And when we turned around, the clouds opened up, and the sun came out, and a rainbow came right down into the institution. It was a phenomenon that just I will never forget. And I said, you know, Waldo, this is going to happen, and it's going to be OK. Because you can imagine how nervous we were. We were scared to death. And uh, then we started down the journey of one of the hardest things we had to do, and that was to take that animal, because we felt very close to these animals. Sorry. It still bothers me. It's very difficult to, um, to make these decisions sometimes. And so we chose um, the most compatible uh, baby baboon for her. And we did, did the transplant as if uh, we were doing any other open heart surgery in a baby. You know, I, I knew that there was a chance that she wouldn't come out alive. And I knew that there was a chance that she would. And I stood there and I, I was pretty emotional. The baby and she and I walked down with bassinet or whatever it was on wheels and went all the way down to the elevator, then down the elevator and to the door of the surgery. And something very special happened there. They stopped just before going through the doors. And she went up by the little girl and bent down and loved her, kissed her, and uh, touched her on the cheek, I think, and then said, um, I love you. As soon as she said, I love you, then they moved the, the thing on into the surgery, and there we stood, looking at a door. And there was a lady that came around the corner. And I don't know who that lady was to this day. She, I believe she was a nurse, or one of God's angels, <laughs> because she handed me um, a little card and it was the, um, had the poem Footprints on it. And I had never read that poem before. I still have that card in her, in Stephanie's Bible. 
This is Stephanie's Bible, and it's been well used. And I bought it for on October the 23rd, 1984. This was the card that the angel handed me. I would have bought this what, three days before her surgery. Her surgery was October 26th. They tried to ease my mind and show me photo albums, and Bill had all these beautiful roses and uh, showed me pictures of the, you know, because he liked photography, and it was, um, you know, just to kind of help give me something soothing to think about other than worrying about what they were doing in the operating room. We have the uh, privilege today of being in the very room, room three and the University Operating Room the uh, Theater Suite. Room three is where Baby Faye's operation occurred. Just imagine, if you will, Baby Faye uh, on that operating table under those lights having her operation 25 years ago. It was so exciting and nerve-wracking and frightening all at the same time, and uh, it was all very quiet and, and yet busy like you would expect it to be, but it very um, together. It was, it was a very beautifully orchestrated and coordinated team that you could see had worked together before. So we uh, brought the donor heart up through the stairwells and the hallways, up through the back way, and then uh, in through the door over here, and uh, deposited in cold saline over near the operating table. And I scrubbed in and, uh, and started the uh, operation on Baby Faye. There really wasn't an atmosphere of uh, stre high stress or uh, you know, everybody's under the gun here type of feeling that some surgical teams could create. And I think that was one of the good things about the team is that Dr. Bailey, his leadership uh, and his confidence uh, you know, permeated the room. It was almost routine even though it really wasn't routine. And then the big moment came when, you know, you look into this child's chest and there's no heart there. You know, when they take that heart out, it's, um, it's really very frightening. And, you know, when we looked at her heart, everything that we, you know, knew about it before was there in front of us then. And clearly this child would not have lived um, in any way. Um, and then, of course, they brought the baboon heart in and it was the perfect size absolutely perfect and he had that heart in in no time and then the big moment came when you start to rewarm the baby let the blood flow through the heart and you're waiting for that first beat the phone rang and you could hear a pin drop on this unit which is unusual on an ICU unit because what we wanted to hear we wanted to hear one piece of information was that heart did the heart beat was it beating and that's that's exactly what the phone call said it's beating and you could hear him you know, they, somebody's loud voice, it's beating. And my gosh, when that happened, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. I said that before, I know it's been on the news, but it's absolutely true. I mean, we were all just choked up to hear that heartbeat, you know, beep, 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 you know, uh, when that, that baboon heart started up. And it looked like a perfectly normal other human heart. It didn't, you know, it doesn't look like a baboon. It, a heart is a heart. And of course the magical moment is always with any heart operation we do is when we, when we sort of allow the heart to resurrect, to recover. And when it takes that first sort of squeeze, um, that's truly a miracle. Finally, uh, it, it, the surgery was over and the nurse calls me and she said, um, the heart is in and beating on its own at 130 beats a minute. And we were thrilled, just thrilled, and we hugged each other, and it was just such a wonderful thing. It was a really, really, really long day, because it just seemed like they were never going to get finished. I think it was probably maybe 4, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We started early that morning. 
before we were able to even go up to Unit 7100. She, um, she made it out of the operating room beautifully, um, brought her into the ICU and then up to her room eventually. I and the others that were deeply involved with her essentially camped out in her room, that's true. Uh, we took turns somewhat, uh, so we occasionally got home for a shower and something to eat. And then the work really started because we had to divide our time between what we didn't want to do, and that is meeting the press, having to deal with all the questions, um, but to spend the majority of our time, for heaven's sakes, taking care of the baby. The good news is that we have a beautiful, healthy baby up on uh, the unit in the hospital. He was doing everything right as of this hour. Uh, we're pleased about that, and in fact, we expected that. The bad news is that as I was shining my shoes this morning, I discovered there's a big hole in the night. <laughs> Soul, which was not the right thing to have for this morning. This is News for LA. Mike Sarge. Good evening, everyone. A 14 day old baby girl is fighting for her life tonight after receiving. It has never been done before, not successfully, and not on a patient so small. The doctors who transplanted the heart of a baboon into the body of a two week old girl yesterday said tonight the infant's condition is improving. The transplant is known to the world as Baby Faye. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> The media, you know, I, I, I have respect for the fact that we have, you know, the First Amendment and we need to know, you know, what's going on in the news and all. There were so many reporters and picketers and so many things that were distractive, you know, at the time. And I was young and I was scared and I wanted everybody to leave me alone. And it just wasn't happening, you know. Within a day or two, she was awake. She was off the ventilator, and she was beginning to uh, take oral nutrition. And we were all spending hours and hours trying to figure out how to transfer the information that we had from the laboratory to her. She was such a beautiful, beautiful child. Oh, she was so beautiful. She had this angelic face, and uh, she had this darling little curl of hair on the top of her head. When, when Stephanie would look at you, she would look like right through you. It was um, a look that I've never seen a baby have before. Um, it was so deep, it was like she was trying to communicate with your spirit. She really was special. It was like she knew what she was here to do. Um, I don't know how to explain that. Baby Faye now has been living with the transplanted heart of a baboon for a full week, and every day of life for her is medical history. Robert Brazell reports tonight that while the long-term prospects are not good, for the moment, she has captured the imagination of the world. Dear Baby Faye, we hope you will be well soon, so you can come out of the hospital. You'll be able to see nature. It's real beautiful. It's prettier than the hospital. You'll be real happy when you see it. You're lucky you have a brave doctor like Dr. Bailey. Love for me. I received hundreds and hundreds of letters from the public that were so supportive. And I think that, you know, along with God giving me strength, that those letters also gave me strength because when I would go home in the evening, um, I would lay and read letters for hours. Teresa had gotten a, a cold, and we were afraid with the baby being on immunosuppression, that it, being exposed to her mom, that um, she might get infected. And at the same time, we all knew very well, and especially nurses know this, you have to have bonding between an infant and their parents, especially the mother. And I was so afraid that if I went into her room, that since her immune system was low, that I, she would get sick from that and die from having a cold. And so I was scared to go in her room. And so what happened is they cleared the room 
very next door to where baby Faye was. And we had a phone connection set up. And that picture is the epitome of what was going on in those couple of days that we didn't want Teresa with baby Faye because she would call on the phone and I would hold the phone to baby Faye and baby Faye would just, she just light up. She knew her mother's voice. It was so beautiful. And it really, it made such a difference to that baby, you know, to be able to hear her mother's voice. It was incredible. I think I might have been reading her nursery rhyme. And I just talked to her and it always looked like she was trying to, you know, look around because she heard my voice and I always thought she was trying to find me. never got to hold her after surgery. Today we grieve the loss of this precious life, which could have been an absolute loss to her loved ones. Her unique place in our memories will derive from what she and her parents have done to give rise to a ray of hope for the babies to come. To this day, we don't know for sure what all conspired to take her life. Uh, but I am comforted in the fact that, uh, that we made an effort to save her life. Her family are are uh, comforted with the notion that they did all they could do to save baby Faye, to grow up in this world. The night that Stephanie died, I asked Dr. Bailey to not let this experience be wasted and to keep going forward with it. And he did. Uh, within a year, we were able to find a human donor for a baby and so we, at that point, abandoned the cross-species protocol and went straight to human-to-human -human transplants. I don't know why it all started with her. You know, God, God only God knows. But it had to start somewhere. Uh, Baby Faye's legacy involves two aspects. One is that we, uh, we accomplished what her parents, particularly her mother and grandmother, had hoped would happen for her. That is, that somebody would try. Sure enough, if we can put a man on the moon, we can at least try. And the other thing that is an amazing legacy of baby Faye are the thousands of babies with new hearts that are growing up today uh, that will likely help change our world.